Committee will come back to order. Mr. Liu. I'm sorry, Mr. Biggs. Okay, let's try again. Mr. Mr. Roy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman. Can the Chairman hear me? Yes. I appreciate that. Uh, Director Ray, I uh, appreciate your service. Appreciate you being here today. Uh, last month, uh, I had a letter that uh, my colleague Thomas Massing and I sent to the Department of Justice requesting further information uh, on prosecutions of individuals who were present at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, earlier you talked about there being over 500 um, uh, investigations, arrests, or, or prosecutions that might be underway. And you categorized them in three categories, those who had peaceably assembled, those who maybe crossed some lines they shouldn't have, uh, and then those who had engaged in violence, obviously, um, and damaging property and harming police. Those are my words, but roughly that. Um, my concern is making sure that those who are there uh, exercising their First Amendment rights are not being swept up into investigations or being wrongfully arrested. I have constituents who are concerned. Will you commit to join personally along with the people necessary to bring in from the FBI to have a briefing for all members of Congress, not just this committee, uh, on this question of the arrests, the nature of the arrests, and, and how that investigation is going? Well, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. First, just I want to clarify one thing based on what you just summarized. We are not conducting investigations, uh, to my knowledge, certainly, of peaceful protesters and certainly not arresting people for peaceful protests. So when I gave those three groups, I wasn't referring to three types of investigations we have, but rather of the three well, types of people who were present in that, the area. Yeah, and yeah. The, I, I, understand, I understand that clarification, but I mean, as a former federal prosecutor, I get it. But will, will you commit to a briefing along those lines? I, I'm happy to see what kind of briefing we could provide to the committee. Obviously, as I alluded in some of the response to some of the earlier questions, because we have now something like 500 cases pending in yep. front of different very particular federal judges, I really have to be careful about what I can commit I to share. I understand that, but a briefing for members of Congress on what happened on January 6th so we can understand the investigations of citizens, both for those of us who want to ensure people have the, the law fully enforced to engage in activities they should have, as well as citizens who maybe might be being wrongfully targeted. I think we ought to have that briefing. Um, I want to turn my attention to the border. Um, does the United States have operational control of our southern border? I'm not sure I'm really the right person to address that. I think that's a better question for the Department of Homeland Security. But as the director of the FBI and someone keenly aware of the illegal and dangerous activities going on with cartels along our border, would you say that the United States has operational control of our southern border? Well, I hesitate to use words like operational control. What I would say is that the, the border security issues are of great concern, uh, and they span everything from violent crime associated with the border, drug trafficking associated with the border, human trafficking associated yep. with the border, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Along those, along those lines, Rick, I'm sorry, you know our time's limited. I hate interrupting, but are you aware that we've had over 700,000 apprehensions since January 1? I don't have the exact number, but I know there are quite a few, to put it mildly. Does it sound right that maybe 300,000 gotaways and releases have occurred, according to sources on the ground? Are you aware that, I'm gonna ask a series of questions, you can kind of answer them in, in mass. Are you aware that through May, the fentanyl numbers for 2021 are 7,400 pounds intercepted at the, at the border compared to 4,700 pounds for all of 2020? Do you agree that fentanyl is one of the most dangerous drugs in the world? And do you agree that, um, that it is infiltrating our communities and our schools and that synthetic drugs, including fentanyl, are by far the fastest part of the opioid epidemic and that we're at unprecedented overdose, overdose deaths in the United States at 91,000, according to the CDC, uh, from October 19th to October 20. Does, does that all sound uh, consistent with what you know about what's going on with our drug communities and our border situation? Well, uh, uh, given your past background, you, you will understand when I refer to what you just asked as a compound question. But suffice, yeah. to say, suffice to say that I totally agree that the drug issues related to the border are extremely significant, that fentanyl, uh, the problem with fentanyl, fentanyl coming into this country from elsewhere, including from the southwest border, um, is uh, something that I think can fairly be described as an epidemic, uh, and I, yeah. Two last questions. Uh, there's also significant problems with human trafficking, upwards of 300,000 people being trafficked in our country, 20,000 being brought into our country every year, even when we don't have the massive numbers we have right now. 
The cartel Jalisco New Generation, operating those Zetas, have recently taken over control of Tamaulipas. They're driving fentanyl. We now have had an 800% increase in Texas of fentanyl seizures. That is a massive number because it's coming into Texas. So my question for you, and I'll close because I'm out of time. My question is, is it what is the FBI doing? Have they provided assets directly to CBP to help work to stop the dangerous reach of cartels, fentanyl, human trafficking into Texas the, and the rest of our country? The gentleman's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Uh, I'll provide a brief answer, and then maybe we can supply some more information after the fact. So certainly, uh, we are very actively engaged with CBP through across all of our border uh, divisions, um, Texas, all the way over to California. Um, and we are working it together with Human Trafficking Task Forces, Safe Streets and Gangs Task Forces, OCDF Strike Forces. We even have tried to contribute by, uh, on the other side of the border, down with our league at working closely on human trafficking and special interest alien issues. And of course, we also have something that a lot of people don't realize we do. Uh, we have so-called TAGS, or transnational anti-gang task forces, even all the way down in the Northern Triangle, where we're trying to work with vetted police officers from those countries to try to prevent, at the source, some of the threat from MS-13 and others uh, going up to the United States. So happy to provide some more detailed information uh, in separately. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen the, the gentleman yields back. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C., there is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been 
kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.